Matthew 18.20 says, For where a two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Let's at all stand and prepare ourselves for the divine service singing as we are gathered. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Eugene, and I'm welcoming today to Belfast Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, David said in one of his Psalms, Psalm 26, verse 8, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Also, David is saying in next Psalm, Psalm 27, verse 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So everybody feels welcome today. Even if you are a visitor or a regular attendee, you are most than welcome in the house of the Lord. It's my duty as well to uh, read a few announcements. All the announcements are already on the bulletin, but I'll just uh, highlight them. The first announcement is about the Pathfinder and Adventurers Club, which is today at 2. Uh, please bring your lunch. And also for those uh, going for the mission level of ABE and PB on the 10th uh, of February, which is next Saturday in Porta Leash, uh, speak with Caroline if you need any further details. Also to keep uh, a few dates in your diary, and one of them is the children's service, which is on the 24th of February. Uh, the next one will be on the March 8 to 10, which is the Voice of Prophecy Mind Fit training in preparation for the Mind Fit event, in, which is running in April. And also at the end of this quarter, we have the Gen Z weekend uh, and, and here in Belfast. So that's on the 29th of March until the 1st of April. Also, Man Ministry Department, they are uh, welcoming uh, all youth and adult males to the Man Sport evening on the 24th of February between 6 and 9 p.m. Uh, there is a reminder about uh, any outstanding lesson book payments uh, that uh, to be given to Patreen, or you can place them in an envelope marked Patreen uh, into the collection plate. Uh, also a reminder about our prayer meeting, which is uh, happening every Wednesday at 7.30 via Zoom. The detail is on the bulletin. Also, we have uh, Christ Object Lesson Studies held every Monday on Zoom with Pastor Gideon at 7 p.m. And also, if you have not done it yet, you can still do it. You can share your talents using the QR code, which is in the bulletin, to share uh, your details uh, or talents or experiences with the pastoral team. And also we have uh, another announcement, is that there are uh, still codes not claimed on the corridor. So the, what, I, what I understand is that from today onwards, those codes will no longer be there. So if you have any codes which is yours, uh, please claim them. Otherwise, they will be disposed from today. Uh, and now, we are, as we are going into uh, our service, 
I would like to read another Bible verse from Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, where in here uh, God is telling to Moses, Do not come near, take off your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The idea for us, which I want to, to, to underline today, is uh, remember we are in the house of the Lord. Let's keep this place uh, uh, in our minds with reverence uh, and, we'll, and try to take off our thoughts, which are daily thoughts, and think more about God because this place is holy. Let us all pray now. Our Father, which are in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to worship you. We are inviting here your presence to be with us, and please give us a blessing to everyone which is in here. In Jesus' name we pray. It. Amen. We are opening our service for today, uh, singing the hymn number uh, 338, Redeem. So let's all stand and sing together this hymn. Malachi 3, verse 10 says, Bring ye the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now, herewith saith Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. We'd ask the deacons to, uh, invite the deacons to lift the offerings.
Let us bow our heads. Dear Lord, we ask that you will bless these offerings and bless the givers that they may further thy work. We ask this in thy name. Amen. a few. Hello. Oh, it's lovely to see your smiling faces this morning. Makes me feel better. I know the last time I was really nervous. This time I'm not that nervous, but your smiles are helping me as well. Okay. So this morning I have some road signs for you. Do you know what some of the road signs on the road mean when you see it? Okay. Well, let's see if you can tell me what these ones mean. So what must you do? Do I keep driving? No. No, I've got to stop. Right. Do any of you know what this one means? No entry. I heard somebody say no entry. Yes, it's a, it's, you, you don't go. If you see this sign, it means you mustn't drive that way because there might be cars coming towards you and there might be a big accident. Right. Does anybody know what this sign means? Traffic lights ahead. The traffic lights ahead. Well done. Does anybody know what this sign might mean? Bumps in the road. Well done, you guys. I think they can all go get their driver's license now. Does anybody know what this means? Speed limit. So that means uh, that's the slowest I can go? The Fastest, good job. So, how fast should I be going with this one? 30. 30 and below, good job. So, 30 or less than 30. Okay, so I have a story today about Uncle Jonathan, who's going to preach today, and when he had a problem with this very sign. It was almost 19 years ago, and he was on his way to work one morning. And he was driving on a road that had a 30 mile per hour speed limit. Now that very morning, his foot was feeling a bit heavy on the accelerator. Do you know what that means? What does that mean? He was going a little bit faster than the speed limit, right? So, as he was driving down the road, this man stepped out of the ro- out into the road and showed him to pull over. Who do you think it was? Yes, it was a policeman. Now, Uncle Jonathan thought to himself, "Uh uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. (laughs) So he pulled over, and the policeman came to him and asked him, do you know how fast you were going? And Uncle Jonathan says, no. And he said, you were going 36 in a 30 mile an hour speed limit zone. And then the, the policeman explained to him why, that, why there was a speed limit there. You see, it was out in the countryside, and there was a train station just outside of this village. And the people used to walk from the village along the road to the train station. And if you were driving really fast, you could ac- accidentally bump somebody and really hurt them. So what do you think the policeman did? What do you think he should have done? Give him a ticket, yeah? Taken his driver's license, maybe, yeah? Put him in jail. (laughs) Well, do you know what? He didn't do any of those things. He just let him go. He just gave him a warning, and he let him go. Do you know what we call that? I think the adults might know what that's called. Well, it is a verbal warning. But it's called grace. When somebody deserves a punishment for something, but we say to them, you know what? It's okay. I'll forgive you. Right. Now, after 
he let Uncle Jonathan go. Do you think Uncle Jonathan went and carried on speeding down the road? No, he paid attention to the speed limit. And I know he did because he called me when he got to work this, that morning to tell me about it. And this is how it is with God too. God also has a set of guidelines for us. Do we know what those guidelines are called, those rules are called? There's 10 of them. The Ten Commandments, yes. They give us guidance on what is good for us. When we break one, it's like breaking the rules of the road. There are consequences. There's always consequences to our actions, good or bad. There will always be consequences. And when we come to Jesus and we tell him that we're sorry for something that we've done wrong, he forgives us. And he doesn't hold on to it anymore. Just like that policeman didn't hold on to the fact that Uncle Jonathan was speeding because he wouldn't remember his name after that. Okay? And that is grace. God doesn't hold on to it. He sets us free. And we can learn from our mistakes. And then we can choose to do better. And you know what? Just like Uncle Jonathan was so excited to call me and tell me about what had happened how the policeman had just let him go, we can also tell our friends and our family about the good news of what Jesus can do for us. So the next time we do something that is wrong, we can go to Jesus. We can ask him to forgive us. And you know what? He will. And you know what else we can do? We can also ask Jesus to help us to do better. Because you can't do that to the policeman, because if he knows that you're going to keep doing wrong, he's going to take your license away, hey? But with Jesus, he will keep forgiving you and keep helping you. Can we remember that? Good. Good job. An hour between eating and sleeping may lower stroke risk. A 1,000 patient study presented at this year's European Society of Cardiology Congress found that waiting 60 to 70 minutes before going to bed after eating reduced the risk of stroke by 66%. And for every 20 minutes more that you wait, stroke risk drops another 10%. That's a fact, but there's hope. Here's a health tip that takes little effort. Wait at least an hour to go to sleep after eating. Not only will you cut your risk of stroke, but previous research has shown that you'll also decrease your risk of acid reflux disease and sleep apnea. So have an earlier dinner and a better night's sleep. Happy Sabbath, everyone. The scripture reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Shall we, <coughs> excuse me, shall we all bow or kneel as we approach the throne, of, the throne of grace for prayer? We thank you, O Father, for the opportunity to come freely to this thy house. We take time to worship you and praise you. 
We also bring to you our petitions to you and know that you will answer our prayers. We ask that you will be with us and bless us as we hear your word. Please help us to gain understanding of your grace as Jonathan ministers to us. Be with those who, for whatever reason, are not worshipping with us today. If they are sick, bring them healing. If they are sad or discouraged, bring them joy and hope. For those who are bereaved, bring them comfort. We pray that you will be with our congregation and help us to go forward together as we pursue the programs of the church and as we reach out to the community. We pray for the wider church and the wider community. And as the political leaders attempt a new start, help them to work together for the good of the people. We think also of the strife in the world as the world waxes old. We know that the, these are the end times, but we still pray for peace. We also pray that others, our families, our friends, our neighbours, see what is happening in the world and that they turn to you in these difficult times. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Church, have you ever felt weak or have you ever felt that whatever you do is never enough? Like we always fall short of glory of God, but we always should remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness.
what your grace really means the price that i could never pay was paid at calvary for who am i to serve you giving up to obey you by giving up my life to you for all of the good things to me I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down each time I will fall short of your glory a father forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the park you'll walk in the park you'll walk in the park oh, it is sufficient Uh, just before I give the mic to Jonathan, I just have another announcement, and that is that is there a, if there is anyone interested in taking part in church ministries like praising team or playing or in the, uh, taking part in the choir, uh, please stay behind at the end of the service and meet with Pastor Todd at the front of the church. Thank you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. I'd like to just start in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house today. And Father, we pray that you will bless this service. I pray that the words that are spoken may be interpreted by your Holy Spirit and may be a blessing to each person that hears, us, hears them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, you can see the sermon title on the screens, and I'm sure that you've heard other sermons about grace before, but just to paraphrase something that a wise man once told me, we live in a world where a lie only needs to be told once, but the truth needs to be told over and over again. And the truth about God's amazing grace is one that I feel is vitally important that we say over and over again. It's wonderful to be here today to look at you from a different uh, perspective. And I realize that as I stand up here, we've been here a few months in Belfast now, but there's still lots of faces that I don't know the names to. Um, so I look forward to getting to know everyone better. Now that I can see you guys from this side, I can see your faces better. Um, but if you, don't me, if you don't know me, my name is Jonathan Edwards. Um, I grew up here in the UK. But about 16 and a half years ago, uh, I moved across the world to South Africa. I followed the love of my life. That was Taryn, who so wonderfully did the children's story earlier. I only planned to go across for six months or so. Um, we were planning to get married and move back to the UK. But through God's guiding, that turned into 16 years and two wonderful children. Then last year, through God's opening and closing of doors, we ended up moving here to Belfast, and it's been really lovely to become part of this church family here. But you know, for me as a young adult, um, as I was back then, it was quite an experience to move to the other side of the world, to a country like South Africa, which has such an amazing and sometimes painful history but it's still a country with such a vibrant mix of cultures and tra traditions. There were some things that made it easy for me to transition. For example, they drive on the correct side of the road. And there were other things that required me to make a personal, a shift in my personal perceptions. 
One thing that I didn't immediately understand was this. When I moved there, I had a job in the city center in an office block, and I would get there nice and early before seven o'clock every morning. Uh, that's another difference. They start in the office a lot earlier in South Africa than here. But anyway, I'd, I'd get there seven o'clock in the morning, I'd park my car, and next to this area where I'd park my car, there was always a group of guys standing there early, early in the morning. So, coming from the UK, what do you think I thought they were up to? What, what would we think here in Belfast if every morning there was a group of guys standing around on the street corner before the sun had even risen? We probably wouldn't think that they were up to any good. I see Brother Polani smiling there. I think he knows where I'm going with this. But as with other things that I had to learn, I quickly realized that they weren't there to do any, cause any problems. In fact, it was quite the opposite. They were there to help in any way they could, so long as you paid them. They would gather at this building to be picked up each day for any kind of manual labor that was available. I would see vans and trucks arrive and a few men would be selected for whatever work the driver was offering. Anyway, I want you to imagine for a moment, for a few minutes, that you're one of these men. You're one of these people there looking for work for that day. On this day, not unlike any other, you're there nice and early. You get to the gathering point, and as usual, you're one of the first people there. There's only a, a few other guys that are there waiting. You nod hello to them, and you begin to settle yourself against the wall. However, before you can get too settled, up drives this farm truck. And the farmer gets out, and he, he offers, speaks to you guys, and he offers you the opportunity to work on his farm uh, for that day for, I'm going to use British money here, for 300 pounds. Now, 300 pounds is a lot of money for a day's manual labor, so you readily accept, glad that you were there nice and early for when he arrived uh, and you could get this opportunity to work for the money. So you jump in the, in the farm truck and you're off to the farm. You arrive at the farm and, and you start working. The work is simple, but it's, it's tiring, and as the sun grows higher and higher in the sky, it starts to beat down on you, and you look out across the farm and you realize that there's just far too much work for you and the four other men to do in one day alone. But you keep working. After all, you're happy that knowing that you will be getting a good day's wage at the end of the day. Around 11 o'clock, the farmer drives away for a short while, and when he returns, he brings with him another five men to join in with the work. This somewhat rejuvenates you as you realize that maybe you might just get the work done in that day. But then as the day moves on and three o'clock rolls around, it becomes clear that even with the extra workers, there's just a bit too much work to do. But what's this? The farmer has gone off again, and as four o'clock gets there, he arrives back at the farm with yet another five workers. These new guys quickly get stuck into the work, and as the shadows lengthen and five o'clock arrives, the work is complete. What seemed like far too much work for one day was actually finished right when it was time to pack up and go home. The farmer gathers you and the other workers and starts to hand out the day's wages. And he starts with those who arrived at four o'clock. You see that he gives them 300 pounds each. 300 pounds! And they hardly picked up tools for an hour. You're so excited, thinking about how much he will surely give you for all the long, hard hours that you worked. You don't even notice how much he gives those who arrived around midday. Then, before you know it, he's standing in front of you, holding out a wad of cash. You quickly leaf through it, counting as you go. 50, 100, 200, 250, 300, 300. 300? But you worked so hard and for so long, and yet he gave you exactly the same as what he had given the guys who had hardly even broken a sweat. 
How can this be? The farmer notices your reaction and calmly reminds you that you were very happy to work for 300 pounds first thing in the morning and that it's his money to distribute as he sees fit and he has every right in the world to be as generous as he wants. I'm sure that many of you will recognize this, my story, as basically being the same as a parable that Jesus once used. In Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, Jesus uses this parable as an illustration of the kingdom of heaven. He compared the kingdom of heaven to a man who hired workers for different lengths of time, then paid them each the same wage. In verse 16, the point is made where he says, and so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, this doesn't mean that Adam, the first man, will be the last person into heaven. No, the, pi- the point of this parable, or of my story, is to show that in God's eyes, when it comes to heaven, no person is greater than the next. There is no preferential seating plan in heaven. Nobody gets special backstage passes. When it comes to God's gifts to us, each of us is offered the VIP pass. The story makes no economic sense, and that's exactly the point. The point being made is about God's grace, and that you can't calculate grace like you can calculate a day's wages. There is also no way that you can work hard enough or long enough to earn God's gift of grace. It's a gift, and each person who receives it receives exactly the same gift. And you know what? It really is a good job that this is the way that God works. Otherwise, I don't think many of us would stand much of a chance. How many of us can say that we have led perfect lives and never sinned. I would be surprised and rather worried if anyone thought that they had done so. Well, listen to this. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then again in Romans 3.23 and 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Both of these passages clearly state that there should be no hope for us. That is, but for the gift of God's grace. Isn't that amazing? I certainly think it's amazing because you know what? I'm a mess. I'm a mess. We're all messy people. Me, you, Everyone, isn't that wonderful? You've got a messy person talking to you right now. This is surely one of the most awesome things of the gospel. The American preacher Brennan Manning says this, Many of us pretend to be sinners. Consequently, all we do is pretend that we are forgiven. As a result, our whole spiritual life is pseudo-repentance and pseudo-bliss. Some preacher tells you, you're a sinner. Okay, I'm a sinner, so I receive God's grace. But so often, especially if you've been a Christian for a while, you end up in that place where you become a respectable Christian, where my sins aren't so bad anymore. I don't swear. I don't get drunk. Yes, I can be a bit selfish at times, And yes, I'll only help out in church when it's convenient, but I'm not that bad a person. We go from realizing that we absolutely stink to a place where we think, well, actually, I'm okay. I can do this praying thing a bit. I can go to church. I serve as a deacon or as an elder. I greet people at the door. I'm even preaching to you right now. I lead a life where, you know what? I'm doing all right. And it becomes a pretend. Where we say to ourselves, look how spiritual I am. We might not think that, but sometimes that's what we're doing. But we need to understand this. The moment that we fail to realize that our sin stinks, 
we lose our wonder at God's grace. You get to the point where you think, well, I'm okay. How much grace do I need? We don't realize how, even our, how bad even our little sins are. Before the pure holiness of God, they just stink. And what Christians tend to do is that we rate sins. You know what I mean. We're not raping and murdering and stealing. We're just a bit selfish and a bit prayerless and a bit lazy. And that's not so bad. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. It stinks. Without God, we are totally unholy. Let me give you a scenario. And I do it like this on purpose. Who does God love more? The young teenage girl getting an abortion? The baby, the fetus who's just been aborted? The surgeon who performed the abortion and was paid handsomely? The anti-abortion protester outside who is fighting to stop abortions? Or the young man that raped the girl in the first place? Who does God love more? You see, in solving that question in your mind, you begin to understand God's grace. He loves them all equally. We can't get it, in, uh, we can't get it that God would love Hitler as much as someone like Mother Teresa. We can't understand that because we go for credit and debit, cause and effect. That's how we, as failing humans, think. But God loves all of humanity. Sometimes people come across as if they're quite all right with certain people burning in hell forever. They go, these rapists and murderers, basically anyone who is not in a group that we think is nice. The thing is, we have seedy sins and non-seedy sins, whereas in God's eyes, all sin is the same. So we grade everything, and we think that we're okay, but actually... We're not. And when we lose sight of the fact that without him, even in our nice, pol polite Christianity, we stink, we lose the effect of grace. We are living by pre pretense and not by grace. We pretend to be sinners. And so our sense of forgiveness is a pretense as well. It's never deep and thorough. If you lose your ability to feel emotion when we sing about being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb who is Jesus, the Prince of Heaven, God Himself, when you lose that emotion, then maybe you've lost your sense of wonder, probably because you've lost your sense of who you are without God. God loves equally. When we see that our selfishness and our prayerlessness is as gross in God's sight as pedophilia, then we begin to understand the grace of God. The Bible says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, even our righteous acts are filthy rags before him. Our righteous acts, not just our laziness and our prayerlessness, but our righteous acts. How amazing is that? I can go to church, I can go to prayer meetings and do Bible studies, I give my tithes and offerings, I can serve in the church, I can read the Bible the whole way through. I can sing hymns in church and do everything outwardly that a wonderful Christian would do. But all of that in no way makes me righteous. Only God is righteous and compared to him, even our best efforts and intentions cannot get us any closer to being righteous. Let me ask you another question. Why did the prodigal son return home? Was it because he loved his father? Was it because he really wanted to work on the farm? Do you know why it was? The Bible tells us he was hungry. We talk about repentance we really do think that we are good sometimes. Even in our sin, we think, yep, but I repented. I came back to God. God totally understands that even in my repentance, my motives can be messed up. Even in my repentance, some of the time, I'm coming back to God because I don't want to be stuck in hell at the end of time. Because I want to be blessed. 
How often do we, in moments of need, ask for God's intervention in our lives? And only at that time do we admit our faults and ask God to help us overcome them. I know that I've done that more times than I care to remember. Even my good motivations are selfish motivations. And everything I do and everything that I can do and everything I think is filthy compared to God. Before God's perfect holiness, even our very thoughts, our very motivations are like filthy rags. Now, I'm not saying don't do things because you look into your heart and you admit that you're not 100% pure. Hey, welcome to the gospel. Nobody is 100% pure. We reach out because of grace. We reach out from one sinner to another sinner saying, well, I found grace. You can find grace too. Nothing you can do will make him love you more. Nothing you can do will make him love you less. It's grace. Filthy rags without him. That's why grace can be sung about as amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I can say, but I'm not, not as bad as a pedophile. I'm not as bad as a rapist. Yes, I am. I'm a sinner. The texts say the wages of sin is death. But if I only, if I only commit sins that the world considers not so bad, does that mean that I will only die a bit? No, it makes no distinction between sins that are big or small. Any sin is sin, and the end result by rights are the same, no matter how the world rates the sin. We should, by rights, have no chance of getting into heaven, but each one of us is given this choice. We find ourselves at a fork in the road where Jesus offers us another way. One way is doubt, and one way is grace. And all we can do is accept the gospel. Listen to Psalms 32, verse 1. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord does not count against him. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19 says, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sin against them. It's basically saying that God is not holding your sin against you. I like that. It's like standing in a courtroom in the dock, and the judge says, what are you in here for? And you say, well, I stole something. Well, let's not hold that against you. Uh, well, I lied. We won't hold that against you. The fact that I'm selfish, we won't hold that against you. For every charge that you can bring about yourself, we won't hold that against you. Um, well, I've murdered. I won't hold that against you. Every single thing that you could list, and more to the point that he could list before the judge, God says, I won't hold it against you. That's grace, not guilty. Don't think that I'm making this up either. The Bible tells it clearly in Zechariah chapter 3. I think this is such a wonderful passage. Basically, the scene is set as a courtroom. God is the judge. Satan is the prosecuting lawyer. And in the dock is Joshua, the high priest. Now, Joshua as high priest is there representing not just himself, but all of God's people. Satan, the prosecuting lawyer, is in the courtroom with a sly grin on his face, knowing full well that he has all the evidence and more needed to completely condemn Joshua. Joshua is so obviously guilty that even the judge describes him as a brand plucked from the fire. He was basically caught in the act. Yet what does God do? Rather than doing the just thing, rather than following the laws of the land, rather than agreeing with all the evidence in plain sight and condemning Joshua, he turns around and looks at Satan, the fancy lawyer, and orders him out of the court. Isn't that amazing? 
Even when we are undeniably guilty, God gives us the gift of grace. It doesn't make any sense in a way that we can calculate. And how can God do this for us? Only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 8 puts it plainly saying, But God commendeth his love unto us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was a popular song a little bit before my time, around 50 years ago, called Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree. It was based on a true story. It comes from a man who committed white-collar crime and was in prison. He had shamed his fi family. He had shamed his wife and his children. And he was in prison for some time. And as it was coming near to the time for him to be released, he wrote to his wife saying, I have shamed you. I have shamed the children and I have shamed the family. I am coming out soon and I can understand if you never want to hear from me again. He says, I will come past the house on a bus and if you want me to come home, tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree outside the house and I will come in. But if there is no ribbon, I will keep on driving. And so the day comes for him to leave prison, and he gets on the bus, and he's driving to his neighborhood. And they turn around the corner into his street. And all down the street, on every tree, there is a yellow ribbon. Not just one, but every tree. The man stops, gets off the bus, and runs into his house. What God has done is that he has tied a yellow ribbon on every tree on your street. And he says, you are forgiven. I will not count your sins against you. In fact, the Bible says, I will remember them no more. Isn't that awesome? That's grace. Let's turn again to the scripture reading. Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. <laughs> Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. This text isn't saying that God will forgive you 490 times, and on the 491st time, he won't forgive you. No, Jesus' response to Peter's question is to give a number that would just be stupid to continue counting to when forgiving someone. It shows that God's grace isn't short-lived. It goes on and on. But what I particularly like about this passage is that it also is an instruction to Peter and to each one of us. God tells us that we should go on forgiving and then go on forgiving some more. How easy is it to get frustrated and even, even lose your cool at somebody when they do the same thing wrong or a friend offend you or does something hurtful to you even just a few times? I'm sure parents can understand that. But God says that he will go on forgiving you and he asks you to do the same. This can often be a, a very hard thing for us to do. But when we remember what God has done for us, all that he has forgiven in our lives, it goes some way to helping us forgive others. To look at it another way, how can we expect God to forgive us if we don't fo follow the forgiveness of our sins by forgiving those who hurt us? The text directly after our scripture reading demonstrate this. Matthew 18, verses 23 to 34 uh, I'm not going to read it all now, as you're probably familiar with it, but it's the parable of the servant who owed a very large amount of money to the king. The king called the servant in to ask him for the repayment, but the servant couldn't pay. So the king ordered that the servant be thrown into jail until the payment was made. The servant falls on his knees and begs, for the, king, begs the king for patience. And the king has pity on him, and he cancels the debt. 
After this, the servant goes out and bumps into another servant who owed him a very small amount of money. The fellow servant drops to his knees and begs for patience, but the first servant refuses and has the man thrown into prison. Picking up from verse 31, it says, when the, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. The great thing about God is that he doesn't leave you where you are. When you let him work in your life, you can't help but look at things and do things differently. How could the servant who was shown so much grace go out and react in the way that he did? In the same way, how can we, when we understand how much God has forgiven us, not have a changed perspective on life? Jesus says in Matthew 7 verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So what are these fruits that we are to be known by? Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then the Bible tells us, Against such there is no law. When we become recipients of grace, it does not mean that there is no struggle with the old temptations of sin. In fact, this struggle often becomes a raging battle between the power of sin in our old nature and the power of grace, which desires perfection in serving God. The only power that breaks the power of sin is the reign of grace. As we struggle against the power of sin in our lives, desiring to live and walk in the Spirit, we are given these guidelines. Galatians 5 verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 tells us, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. This word followers comes from the Greek word mimets, which means an imitator. And when we fix our eyes upon Jesus, we become his imitators. It is only through Jesus Christ that grace reigns. That is where we can gain the victory over pride, presumption, and the lusts of the world. 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what's the point of all that I'm saying today? Well, I wanted to share with you a reminder of just how wonderful God's grace, God's love for each of us is. It's on a scale that we find hard to understand. Like the story of the farm workers who were all paid the same no matter how long they worked, it even seems unfair. And if we look at it from a worldly point of view, it is unfair. We are not worthy of heaven, yet God offers, us, offers it to us anyway. There's a documentary film called Amazing Grace. And in it, there is a scene from the original Nelson Mandela concert held a long time ago now for Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday in 1988 at Wembley Stadium in London. All day long, the 70,000-strong crowd had seen performances by various rock bands and be had become very loud and boisterous, no doubt aided by plenty of alcohol. 
The last act scheduled for the concert was the opera singer, Jessie Norman. Finally, the time comes for her to sing. A single circle of light follows her, a majestic African-American woman wearing a flowing African dashiki as she strolls onto the stage. No backup band, no musical instruments, just Jessie. The crowd stirs, restless. Very few of them recognize the opera diva. A voice yells out for more guns and roses. Others take up the cry. The scene is getting ugly. Alone, a cappella, Jessie Norman begins to sing, slowly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. A remarkable thing happens in Wembley Stadium that night. 70,000 raucous fans fall silent before her song of grace. By the time Norman reaches the second verse, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." The soprano has the crowd in her hands. By the time she, she reaches the third verse, "'Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." Several thousand fans are singing along, digging far back in nearly lost memories for words they heard long ago. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Jessie Norman later confessed that she had no idea what power descended on Wembley Stadium that night. I think I know. The world thirsts for grace. When grace descends, how can our point of view not be altered? Now that you know what God has done for you and you are standing at that fork in the road, I pray that you will allow God to work in your life and choose his way. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's all stand now and sing the closing hymn, Amazing Grace.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before ages, now, and forevermore. Amen.